This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is John Casti. He's an author, mathematician, and entrepreneur. As an author, John has written more than 120 scientific articles and seven technical monographs and textbooks on mathematical modeling. To say that John is prolific would be an understatement. Our conversation today centers on some key issues and ideas. The science of surprise mood, social mood, the collective social belief. How does a social mood get created? And what John calls X events. This is not a trading episode per se. You are not going to find investing insight in this episode. However, what you will find is a very strong psychological thought process. As John describes what he calls socioeconomics. There are reasons, there are understandings for why the crowd goes in a direction, for why the crowd goes wild. You can't predict any of that, and John is not about to say that he can predict any of it. However, it is absolutely worthy of conversation to think about this mood, to think about surprise. And then how can one put themselves in the best position that when the anarchy hits, the chaos hits, that you are in a position to either thrive or survive or both? I hope you enjoy this conversation with John Casting. I've had a lot of behavioral uh, psychologists behavioral finance pros, behavioral economics pros on my podcast, explain for me, put out there for the audience right out of the gate, the socionomics compared to the other fields that, that feel similar. But why don't you, from your perspective, explain the differences? Socionomics is about how the mood, the beliefs of a population about its future impact or bias, if you like, but not necessarily determine the kinds of events that you can expect to see in different time frames in the future. So, for example, if the mood of the population is positive and that they are optimistic about the future, then you can expect to see collective social events of the type that you would use words like happy, welcoming, uh, joining, that kind of uh, events of that type. So, for example, the let's say the formation of the European Union back in the late 1950s, it happened in a period when people were optimistic, looking forward to the future. And so there was a kind of joining the psychology in place. Today, uh, in general, populations, not just in Europe, but globally, especially in the Western half of the world, are rather pessimistic, rather fearing the future rather than welcoming it. As a consequence, you tend to get events that use words like separating, rejecting, and so forth. To a large degree, that's exactly what we're seeing, especially here in Europe. So that's what socionomics is about. It's about how the beliefs of a population about its future bias the kinds of collective social events that you are likely to see. Now, I, I use the term bias advisedly because, as I said a moment ago, these beliefs do not determine the kinds of events that happen. It's a little bit more like weather forecasting. If you have uh, information about the temperature and wind velocities and air pressures and so on in the town where you live today, then you can say the likelihood tomorrow is that the weather will be sunny or rainy or whatever, but it doesn't mean that it has to turn out that way. And we know that weather forecasters often get it wrong. 
And the reason they get it wrong is because these factors today that you can actually measure are biasing factors. They're not determining the weather. So that's, that's the short story for socionomics. You know, John, I was thinking about this idea of mood mattering, you know, the, the idea of mood matters. And I was thinking back to March of 09. And even though, this is my humble opinion, we'll see how you, see if you concur or you tell me I'm crazy, but even though it was never explicitly said, I thought that the alphabet soup of interventions that unfolded in March of 09 in the United States of America by the Federal Reserve, etc., I really thought that was all about controlling mood. And I think at that juncture, the powers that be thought we have to stop with whatever tools we have, the mood going more sour. And I think there was a real feeling in March of 09, because I tell you what, that stock market felt like it was just not going to stop. And I think the powers that be were really concerned about mood, even though they never really expressly stated that. Well, I don't think they were, uh, they, they were not socionomists at heart. But I tend to agree with you completely that in those times, people were very fearful of the future. They were essentially fearing the whole global economy would come uh, undone and we'd go back to some uh, Stone Age kind of economic structures. And the economic powers like the Fed and others, they did just exactly what you say. They, they were trying to stop right dead in its tracks, this sort of spirit of pessimism, if you want to term it that way. And they were pretty effective, actually, in, in that respect. Because sometimes people ask me when I give talks about social mood uh, or and socionomics, and they ask me, well, gee, uh, if people were pessimistic, couldn't we do something to change that mood? Well, how is it that the mood actually is formed? Because we're talking about the, the a property of an entire population, a collection of individuals, each of whom has their own beliefs about the future on different timescales. That's an important factor, too. Uh, if I ask you, how do you feel about tomorrow? Then you, you might give me a very different answer than if I ask you, how do you, uh, how do you feel about 10 years from now or 10 days from now? So the, the mood is a time dependent uh, factor. And how is it that the beliefs of a whole collection of people somehow get integrated together into a collective uh, social belief? Uh, of the entire population. And the hard facts of the matter, Michael, is are that there is no such method for, uh, nobody knows how that process takes place. It's obvious that it has to do with the interactions of the people making up the population, but exactly in what way do those interactions matter and generate this emergent property of a collective social belief is unknown territory. And I, I personally, I think this is one of the single most interesting and important research questions in this whole area of social mood is how does that mood get created? And so a lot of people, you know, you try many different things, like what was you mentioned about the economy back in March of 2009, uh, but you don't, you don't know whether they're going to work or not because you don't really know how the mode is generated. You just you can sort of use some intuition and beliefs and maybe some past experience, and maybe if you get lucky, uh, like the Federal Reserve did in those times, uh, you can have some success. You know, if you really have that method in your hand of how to generate social mood, it'd be worth a lot of money. There are lots of people want to know how to do that. You know, you were mentioning Europe, and I know you're in a very fine city in Europe today that I've had the chance to visit, uh, Vienna, Austria. Mood in Europe today, is it best reflected in the euro itself? I mean, the, the currency, the currency is just, I mean, we're almost at a parity with the dollar, which is almost unthinkable, but a few years ago even. Well, yeah, they're, they're, this is getting into the second big question about social mood. How do you measure it? And, of course, this, this whole idea was first, I think, put forth by a financial analyst named Bob Prechter, who you may or may not have had on your program. But he's head of a company called Elliott Wave International. And Bob Prechter is, was a big belief, a believer in the idea that the stock market was a kind of leading indicator of social mood, that when the stock market is 
going up in general, uh, that's a reflection of people's beliefs about the future, that they're optimistic about the future, and conversely, if it's going down. Now, I think that there's some good arguments for why one might take that as a sociometer, a measure of social mood. At the time, Bob Prechter put it, put it on the table, which was quite a number of, of, of years ago, maybe even a couple of decades ago, because in those times, people could imagine that the price movements in the stock market were really a reflection of the actions taken by a large number of more or less independent uh, investors. You know, lots of people, that, because basically you take out a position in the financial markets, uh, you're getting, it's a bet, you're making a bet about the future. Uh, if you, if you're betting that a certain stock or a certain index is going to go up in the future, then you take out a long position. Or if you think it's going down, you take out a short position. And the stock markets themselves, the stock indices, uh, are simply a way of gathering all those bets together and synthesizing them into a single number, a change of price. And, and, and that idea, I think, works very well. Until, until rather recently, until maybe even in this period that you're talking about, the last, uh, last five, ten years, when I think that the character of the financial markets has changed pretty dramatically. And I think that it, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, for example, is no longer reflective of the beliefs of a wide variety of, let's call them individuals. I think that those numbers, the S&P 500 or the Nikkei or the Dow Industrial Average is the reflection of the beliefs of a small handful of very big institutional investors. Because one could then could ask the question, well, if the index is a measure of social mood, the index has been soaring off into the stratosphere for the last six years. Uh, why is it that you go out and talk to people and they are not so optimistic about the future in general? I've had a lot of discussions recently with these people at LA Wave and elsewhere about a mood indicator that is a better reflection of how people feel today than a a financial market index. And I don't know about here in Europe whether the euro itself, I think that what has happened with the euro over the last uh, a couple of months or so is more a uh, an effect of social mood rather than a, gen a, a ref it's a reflection, but it's not a leading indicator. It's sort of a lagging indicator. Uh, the people were pretty pessimistic already. Uh, what back when the euro was in the 120s or 130s even, people were already pessimistic here in Europe. So the fact that now it's finally gone into decline is probably more a reflection of the fact that the euro, uh, people are even more pessimistic today than they were five years ago, and that the U.S. markets, or the U.S. economy, if you like, is di diverging pretty dramatically from what's going on here. And that, that, of course, gives rise to this, these currency uh, uh, declines, if you are able to decline versus the dollar. Let me unpack something that you mentioned. You know, I've not had a chance to chat yet with Bob Prechter, my podcast. I'm going to have to get him on. I, I've had a chance to meet him briefly years back. But of course, when Bob's name comes up, uh, for those people that know of Elliott Wave, there's going to, and I, I have friends and associates that respect uh, the work, and then I have friends and associates that say, no way. But I think, and I've seen your comments about prediction, and they, they dovetail right in with mine, which is the, the, ab the ability to predict financial markets. I, I've seen everything you say in your writings, your words. This is not something you share in the belief of. So why don't you unpack for the audience the value that you see in something like Elliott Wave, because for a number of people out there, they're going to say, well, hold on, you know, Elliott Wave, uh, Bob uh, made a prediction, it didn't come true. But I think you're looking at it, and, and you can help educate me too, you're looking at it in a, in a different way and seeing a value there beyond perhaps how some people have used it to attempt to predict markets. I know that's a mouthful, but am I, you see where I'm going? I see where you're going, and I'm happy to address that question. I'm glad you asked it, Mike. Yeah, first of all, I think you have to disconnect the idea of socionomics, that social mood is a leading indicator of social events. You disconnect that from Elliott Wave theory. And Bob Prechter, 
joins them together because he wants to use uh, the financial market in disease as a measure of social mood. And he happens to like the Elliott Wave principles for giving you insight into how the financial markets are likely to move in the future. And in fact, in a kind of, uh, in, from my perspective as a mathematician, I think that the uh, Elliott Wave uh, theory is, it's okay from the standpoint of a topological indicator of the uh, uh, market movements, but it's actually very, very weak in the single most important aspect, and that is timing. It's very weak in timing. It doesn't give you much indication whatsoever about when certain things are more or less likely to happen. It tells you that the waves have a certain pattern and that these patterns repeat themselves, but it doesn't tell you if you stretch out the patterns along the time scale, the topological structure, you know, where they're going up and where they're going down. So that topological structure stays the same, but the timing can be way off. You, you can be very, very, become very poor by waiting for those waves to fulfill their destiny. Seth, forget about Elliott waves for a minute. And if you think about human social events in general, and that's something that I'm working a lot on now. And uh, in fact, I've just finished a book that will come out later this year, I hope, uh, on this, what I'm going to tell you right now. I believe that all human events, extreme or otherwise, are a combination of two factors. The first one is what I call the context. It's, there's a kind of, it, it's a landscape of events that, that is continually dynamically shifting. And you might find yourself at the current moment, say, sitting on a uh, surface that looks like a tabletop, very flat. And as a consequence, some random perturbation or disturbance doesn't move from, push, it pushes you away from that place, but it can't push you very far because there, there's nowhere to go. You're on, you're, it's a, it's a, you're on a plateau, unless you happen to be at the very edge, which is very unlikely. On the other hand, if that plateau over the course of time, if that context morphs into a sharp mountain peak, and you happen to be now sitting on that mountain peak, not on the, a flat plateau, then even the most small perturbation can push you off into a deep valley, and you can have what I call an X event, an extreme event, a crash. Or it might be a, not a crash, it might be the opposite, uh, a, a surge. The, the determining factor, there are two factors, and I told you the context is one. Where are you on the landscape, and what does that landscape look like? And the second one is a random trigger, uh, some event that by its very nature is random, means it has no pattern, it pushes you in some direction from where you are, and if you're on that mountain peak, then you get a crash. Otherwise, you get something else, maybe. But the fact is that I don't believe that you can predict random triggers. But as I said, their nature is random, they have no pattern, they're not predictable. You know, you, you can't predict that, but you can predict, or at least get some insight, anticipate is probably a better word than prediction, how that landscape is shifting, how that context is shifting. Are we on the flat table or are we on the peak of the mountain? That's that's what you're saying. Let's look at the context for yeah, that. Or, or somewhere in between. That's yeah. the context, that landscape, and how it how it moves over the course of time. And if you see that you're getting into a danger zone, that your former plateau is now morphing into a peak, then it, it's a signal that says, you better start being careful. And either take some action to try and flatten out that peak, or at least anticipate uh, the kind of trigger that might push you into a certain valley, push you off that peak. Just to give you an example, you remember a few years ago, there was the so-called Arab Spring, and that spring started in Tunisia and the context was that the the population of the of the country they were at a mountain peak they were ready to be pushed into one or another kind of valley and the random trigger happened to be some fruit seller who burned himself up in the street well who could predict what would that that would trigger off it's what we now call, give the name the Arab Spring well, it did, uh, and it was unpredictable, that specific event, but it was not unpredictable to say that something like that might generate a 
a major social movement because the context was right for that kind of a movement. It happened to be this fruit seller uh, immolating himself in the street, but it could have been something else. So when the situation is right to push you off the edge, then you start looking, where might I end up? And those valleys that you could end up in, they're not the same size and shape. Some are more likely than others. And this is where the social mood comes into the picture. The social mood really tells you what kinds of valleys are, are more or less likely at a given point in time. There's always going to be a cost to trying to get into that position of capturing the surprise. There's never, I don't think there's ever going to be a way to uh, perfectly time the surprise without some cost to get there. Well, you're, uh, you're absolutely right about that, Mike. I mean, that, that's the basic scheme is that you anticipate that you're, you get into a region where you can anticipate that something dramatic is more likely to happen now than, than it was uh, a while ago. And you take out, as you say, a lot of position. You take out some put or call options, depending on what you're anticipating, far out of the money put or call options so that you don't have to pay too much for them and expect they're probably going to expire worthless. And so you're going to have a lot of small losers, but hopefully you have a few home runs that pay for all the losers and leave you something extra for your efforts. That's the, the general, the general scheme. And there's good reasons to believe why it is that you cannot predict with any accuracy these uh, what I call critical points where the, the big surprise or the extreme event actually happens. Uh, it's real simple. Uh, if you, if you say, look at some time series of data, it has ups and it has downs and so on. And if you ask, pick a point of time at random and say, what's this series going to look like in the next time moment? The answer is very e easy to give. You don't need a f to be a, a futurist to tell that. If you say, what's going to happen tomorrow? You say, tomorrow's going to be just like today, except a little better or a little worse, depending on whether the current trend is up or down. This is what makes trend following so attractive. But the fact is, those places where the current trend changes where it flips to the opposite, those there, I call them the critical points. That's what they're called in mathematics. They form a set of measure zero on the set of all time moments. So if you pick a time moment at random, you have probability zero that you're going to pick one of those critical points. They are very rare, in other words. Since they're rare, it makes a lot more sense. Trend following is actually not a bad uh, idea because almost always you're right, except when you're not. So what I'm looking at is how can I get some indication not to predict the critical points because I think it's impossible, but I think you can start getting some feeling when you're getting near one of those critical points, when the current trend, whatever it is, is just about ready to give up. It's running out of gas and it's going to flip to its opposite. Now that flip might be something rather smooth and gradual, still a critical point. It's a change of trend. But what you're really looking for is where that flip is sharp and that where the curvature of the time series at that point is very great. Yeah, John, I was thinking about this X event concept that you outlined. And I was thinking back to late 1999. And I was thinking of the Y2K fears. And I wonder if people have been Mm, that Y2K fears and nothing happening, if it makes it harder because of that unique point in time in history where we, we really had a societal fear build up that everything was going to stop. I mean, there was a real something built there. We didn't, I don't think anybody anticipated, I mean, there'd be some people, but it, at least what was in popular culture and media was that there was going to be a big problem uh, come January uh, 1, 2000, and then there wasn't. And I, I wonder today, though, if people, and I would love for you to take it a little bit deeper on the X event, I wonder if people really think it's possible that we could have the electrical uh, interruption, the food interruption, the water interruption. And I am not trying to be a survivalist or anything like that. You're a mathematician. You're looking at the data. But I think it's, it's open questions. It's open for thought that could things break? Could the system break? And that's where you're really going with the X event, isn't it? Well, it is in, in many ways. You're right, Mike. Of course, you know that the uh, history books are filled 
with uh, statements uh, and stories about end of the world predictions where the end of the world did not happen. And that Y2K, uh, is a, is a good, more relatively recent illustration of that. But you, you know, you read these stories of these uh, survivalists or religious fanatics or whatever that go out in the desert and say that, uh, that it was supposed to happen the end of the Mayan calendar. This was something that was supposed to happen. 2012. Well, the Mayan calendar uh, came and went, but uh, there was no uh, big uh, uh, dramatic events. But uh, dramatic events do happen uh, periodically. Uh, Some of them are of the kind that come from nature. You know, we do get asteroid impacts. We do have records of earthquakes that were pretty devastating and so on. Somehow the world manages to uh, carry on. A major global financial panic would be a pretty big X event. Its Xness, if you like, is high. But there are, you know, lower level X events that happen all the time in, in localized region. You know, the internet go, crashes or this Ebola fever panic, you know, of a few months ago. That was an X event. It was certainly an X event in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Uh, it didn't turn into a global X event. That was, we dodged a bullet a little in, in that case. And so, so you can, you have to, uh, think about not just is an event a regular event or an X event, but, uh, every event has a certain level of Xness and the, the, the events that don't have much social impact, they, their Xness is basically zero. And the ones that, that wipe out the world, if you like, like that Ebola could have done, uh, their Xness is very high, near, near one, for example. From an investing point of view, of course, you're going to get a bigger return on your investment if, if it, if you strike gold, if the Xness is high, if the surprise factor is real big and the impact is also big, as long as the impact, you, but, but you don't want to have an X event that's going to kill the investor. That doesn't help you at all. So you, you, you're looking for something uh, high, but not uh, fa- not completely fatal. I thought it was interesting during the Ebola scare that the here we are facing this situation that's unknown. It's it's unpredictable. It's clearly expanding and multiplying. Uh, it, it's some progression uh, that, that's frightening in Africa. And I thought that it was it was fairly cavalier. Here we are facing this unknown, and in and, and the quote, good old days, I think we would have all said, you know, put our foot down and said, and this is not any kind of a sociological uh, pronouncements against any one country or race or anything, but because it could have happened anywhere, uh, there could be some virus of some sort. But in the good old days, I think we would have been a little more pragmatic, and I was was really amazed at the cavalierness of, of putting uh, very infected people onto planes, governments doing this and flying them around the world, at that exact moment where you would think, okay, things aren't as robust as we once thought. Things are going a little bit mm, odd. Maybe we should buckle down and, and be a little more defensive. And, it, and, it, and nobody seemed to really care. That's, that's what drove me. And then people said, well, Mike, you're an alarmist. Why should, don't worry about it. It won't be a problem. And I'm, I'm just thinking, what's happened to us as a culture and a society? I talked to a lot of people about what you and I would call a catastrophic or extreme events, or I call them X events. And people, often you get a reaction that is, in, in my opinion, totally illogical, and it is illogical, but it's the way people feel. They say, I don't want to hear about a global pandemic or a global crash of the internet. It's too horrible to contemplate. And then, Therefore, it cannot happen. It's too, I don't want to think about it. Therefore, it can't happen. It's sort of the head in the sand kind of uh, business. And in fact, uh, of course, we know from uh, the historical record that sometimes things do happen. Now, we also know from the historical record, as you pointed out, more often than not, they don't happen. The people say the end of the world, or they say the computer systems are going to all crash, Y2K style, and then it doesn't happen. There's a certain kind of defense for people, that, for these uh, head in the sand people, because most of the time, the people who point out or even predict that something awful will happen, it doesn't happen. 
but occasionally it does. And usually when it does, it was never predicted. That's the interesting part. People may, Maybe then after the fact, you go back and somebody says, hey, look at my paper from 20 years ago where I predict that this would happen. Well, uh, that, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't help in preparing for uh, these events. But I think that these kinds of, of really major, I'll call them infrastructure collapses, are a lot more likely today than they were in the good so-called good old days for several reasons, not the least of which is the whole world is just vastly more interconnected than it ever was before. For in, not just information, but uh, think about uh, globalization, the interconnections in terms of food supply and in terms of uh, manufacturing products and so on, that there, the chains are much longer. And, uh, that mean, and if any link in the chain gets broken, then the system uh, can't function. And this means that uh, we have to be on top of these much longer and more delicate supply chains that provide us with the style of life that at least those of us in the West are accustomed to. In connection with Ebola fever, it wouldn't have taken very much for it to all of a sudden become a global pandemic. The, the, the saving grace, in my opinion, of that particular situation was that that fever could only be transmitted by direct contact with somebody who was ill. It could not be transmitted through the air. So you couldn't, and not like flu or cold, where all you have to do is breathe in a few droplets of from somebody's sneeze and you get the illness. You can't get evil of fever that way. But it could have mutated into something that would have been really ugly. It didn't, but uh, the next time around, some other disease may uh, turn up that, that will be a real mass killer, like, like influenza was back in 100 years ago, after the First World War. It killed hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people worldwide. It's slightly out of our where we're going today, but I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, and I'm not... I'm, I'm not seeking any kind of prediction or a forecast. I'm I'm more seeking uh, insights from a man who's who's got some experience. You've got some years, and and you're right there in the heart of Europe. Where and look, uh, Europe is a very complicated place. Many many countries inside these countries. There's there's uh, there's 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 small small groups that are that are completely different. So it, it's a very complicated place, but it's also interconnected. But and we've only got a few minutes left, but. How does Europe feel to you today? First of all, a lot of what you see in Europe today is eerily like a rerun of the 1930s in terms of massive unemployment, uh, financial crises. Uh, now you have down in the Ukraine saber rattling and I, I just read in the paper yesterday that in Lithuania and in Poland, the governments are mobilizing uh, training for in, uh, uh, to resist an invasion. They somehow think that maybe the Russians will turn their attention back to the Baltic. So all of this stuff, if you go back and look at the 1930s, which was the prelude to the Second World War, is the, the, the same pattern is present. I think that this is, I find it a little bit scary, and I have to tell you, I'm sitting right now talking to you from my apartment in the center of the center of Vienna, which I regard being in the center of the center of any major metropolitan area as one of the worst possible places you can be if the you-know-what hits the fan. And you could ask me, say, well, what have you done to uh, you know, make any preparation if that happens? Well, I can tell you, because because I tell people all the time, I say, don't, you have to start thinking about these possibilities before they happen and make a plan for what you're going to do if they happen. Don't wait until it happens and then start trying to make a plan. Uh, that's not going to help you. And so what did I do? Well, I bought a house and I bought a house on the other side of the ocean in the USA in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a place that I know well and lived there for many years and I love very much. So it's a small house, kind of like a retreat, a place, a panic, a place to go. I get on an airplane, close the door in my apartment here in Vienna, get on an airplane and fly across the ocean to New Mexico to the mountains and stay there for a while and put an ocean between me and what's going on in Europe right now. 
Now, it's not a guaranteed solution that I'm going to be 100% bulletproof. Uh, things come to the USA as well. But even in the USA, a uh, place high up in the mountains of New Mexico is better than being in Chicago or New York or L.A. If it doesn't happen, I still have a nice place to go and have a vacation. That's my answer to your question. John, we'll have to leave it there. Interesting stuff. I, I don't think the vast majority of the populations around this planet are preparing for much other than to wake up tomorrow and get on Facebook and play a video game. I, I think there's not a lot of preparation. I'm not trying to be an alarmist or anything. That's just the way society has gone right now. And I think, as you kind of point out, maybe to some degree, whether willingly or unwilling, we're, we're waiting for the X event. Well, one thing you can be assured of, as I said earlier, these X events happen all the time. X events of their various magnitude, of various types, in various places. Uh, somehow people manage to muddle through. If a, I mean, there are certain kinds of X events that could happen and we wouldn't muddle through. A big asteroid impact or a massive supervolcano explosion uh, like Yellowstone National Park uh, could go volcanic again. Then uh, basically uh, we can all turn out the lights and say the party's over. But those are such ultra extreme, extreme events that you can't organize your life around uh, that kind of a thing. You just, if that happens, you know, you just say, well, it's bad luck. I happen to be alive at the wrong time. For, for some of these other ones, like I said, what you talked about political disturbances here in Europe, uh, I think that there are some you know, sensible things that you can do to at least build in a little bit of insulation between you and the potential problem at not too high a cost. Hey, John, where's the best place we can send people to check you out? Your books are on Amazon. Where's the best website we can send people? Go to my page on Wikipedia. Okay. That, that's the best place. Okay. Easy enough. And, and Amazon if you want to look at uh, something about the books that I've written. Hey, John, thank you for taking the time today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.